welcome to the lectures on GPU architectures and programming. In the previous lecture, we have started our initial discussion on profilers like NVPROF. So, uh, this is a profiler which essentially you can execute in command line, it is available both in Linux, Windows and OS X Mac OS version. It can collect statistics pertaining to different program events and metrics at the same time. It is a standalone tool and does not require the programmer to use the CUDA events API. This is important because earlier we discussed about how to use the CUDA events API, which, which we actually samples the timings uh, from the program and using the CUDA events API, you can actually catch the timings, but that actually makes uh, is, is a burden on the programmer because then you actually have to insert suitable timing codes or CUDA event calls inside your program. So, in, in, in case you do not want to use that path, this is an alternate way to use it. That means, you run your program under this profiler setup. We will just see some examples that how does it differ. I hope you all remember how to use the CUDA events API. You can consult our earlier lectures where you showed how I can insert this kind of uh, suitable uh, data types from the CUDA event API and, and sample out time from the CPU or the GPU's performance counters. So, here is an example where what we are doing is we are executing the code of transpose, right? The host, this is the, this is the original executable. I am passing it uh, parameter 0. So, that would execute the naive row kernel, right? And if I pass it transpose parameter 1, it will execute the naive, uh, uh, naive col uh, column kernel, if, just, if you can just see. So, here case 0 was for naive row and case 1 was for naive column. So, this is our original transpose, uh, transpose executable, but when I execute it, I do not I don't execute it standalone. I execute this with the under the nvprof profiler. I pass it these different parameters, which essentially say what are the performance statistics I am interested in. So, essentially it will uh, run this kernel possibly multiple times and try to compute some statistics out of it and give me the required architectural parameters which I am interested in. So, here essentially when I specify global store and global load throughput, that means I am asking the profiler that okay, you provide me with these statistics that what is the number of loads and stores happening and what is the bandwidth that is getting utilized. That means how many loads and stores are happening per second in terms of how, how many bytes of data is getting load and loaded and stored per second, what is the minimum and maximum ranges and all that. So, you can take a minute and uh, just uh, look into the statistics that has been provided here by the, uh, by the profiler. So, it is separately giving me the global load and global store throughput values, the number of bytes, the maximum that have been written or being read per second and also a minimum. So, essentially this is a profiler which is going to run the code multi, multiple times and do a statistical observation out of it. So, uh, the same thing we will do uh, just, uh, so just uh, if we look at uh, the performance statistics once again and try to match with our original ideas. So, when you are doing naive row, essentially your number of loads will be much smaller than the number of uh, stores you are doing because you are loading by row which would be coalesced and you are storing by column. And as you can see that <coughs> the idea quite really matches here, right? Because the, uh, the, the load throughput is quite low, whereas the stored throughput is quite high for the knife row implementation. Now, if you look into the other implementation of the knife column, so uh, if, you, if you just remember our original program, if the user passes that command, I mean the command line option of 1 with the executable transpose, then that 1 will get into the argv1 part, right, the argv, met argv part and that would be transferred to i kernel, which will indirectly get into the switch part, switch statement and it will actually give the function pointer to the, it will make, make it point to the kernel for doing the knife column execution, right. So, Again, when I execute that code with uh, this option 1 under the nvprof profiler, I again get the load and store throughput. So, now since I am doing a naive column implementation, so I am loading by column, that means there would be too many loads and uh, the number of stores would be much smaller because the store is now coalesced. 
and uh, it gets reflected right as you can see that the throughput for store is much smaller whereas the throughput for load is much higher. Now, with a, I mean uh, the statistics that gets collected by NVPROF, they can actually be uh, rendered into a nice GUI based tool called NVPP, NVIDIA Visual Profiler. So, this profiler, this software provides a GUI based tool for analyzing CUDA applications and it supports a guided analysis mode for optimizing across kernels. So, I can, uh, I can actually get the statistics from NVPROF. The NVPROF provides a minus analysis minus matrix option when I execute NVPROF, which can capture all the GPU metrics for use. And uh, these statistics will be cap cap uh, actually stored in a format which is usable by the visual profiler. So, next when I run the visual profiler, it can render the statistics in a nice manner and it can help me to analyze the performance from the GUI, right. Now, of course, uh, I can I have to use this minus of flag with the with nvprof to dump a log file uh, that ha has to be imported to nvpp so you can just uh, learn to use this thing uh, we'll just show that how uh, when we ran this uh, original nvprof comments we ran this uh, nvprof comments the outputs can uh, actually be rendered through nvpp uh, and uh, through this kind of a nice gui so this is a statistics profiling statistics for the naive row kernel and uh, as we can see we the exact timings for the start end they are provided and we also have the execution duration some 8 point of uh, 017 milliseconds and uh, similarly and also uh, the statistics we have asked here is for the different utilizations so the compute utilization the memory load store utilization they are actually plotted nicely since this is a uh, less compute intensive, but more communication intensive load store intensive uh, kernel and that can quickly be gauged from this statistics chart that has been provided right. So, we have lot of memory operations, but much less number of compute operations here and a significant amount of very large number of memory loads and stores here. Similarly, I can also do that for the <coughs> load by uh, column case. Uh, so, uh, so this is the knife column implementation. As you can see, uh, interestingly, for knife row, I have some timing which is 8 milliseconds. For knife column, I have even more timing, uh, even more timing requirement which is around 14 milliseconds. Now, that is an interesting question here, right? Because, uh, of course, in one case, the knife row case, loads are coalesced, but stores are not coalesced, whereas in the knife column case, loads are not coalesced, but stores are coalesced. So, if I do a compute analysis, I also can get the charts here in terms of utilization. Uh, so, uh, this is the uh, this is the utilization chart here. If I plot them side by side, as we can see the load stores apparently if I call if I if I just call, uh, provide them the number of the utilization for the load store is further small in the knife column case with respect to the knife row case and that actually matches with the execution time statistics because from our observation for the naive row case, uh, the uh, execution time was smaller, it was some 8 millisecond, whereas for the naive column case, the execution time is much larger, it is 14 millisecond. So, it is much larger and that gets reflected here in terms of the utilization of load stores. In case of uh, naive column, the utilization is less, but uh, again, if we <coughs> If we come to doing the comparison with respect to the memory band, uh, memory bandwidth that has been computed, uh, that has been that has been that is that has been consumed here for the uh, knife row as well as the knife knife column implementation. Let's go one by one. So for the knife row implementation, this is what we have. So as we can see that we have uh, since this is by row, so the number of global loads is less. The number of global stores are much much more. And uh, so, this is basically the number of global loads that we are having and then uh, <coughs> this is the uh, also this also provides you with the statistics of the L2 cache that uh, how many reads are performed uh, by the uh, 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 how many how many reads are performed by the L1 from the L2 cache and uh, how many similarly how many writes are performed by the L1 to the L2 cache. 
right. Now, something interesting as you can see that the number of L 1 reads is much more with respect to the global loads, right. Uh, it is of course, 4 times. Now, what is the reason for that? The fundamental reason is that in, G, in our GPUs, uh, the L 1 is 128 byte wide. The cache lines of L 1 are 128 byte wide, where so the essentially that is 32 times 4 bytes. So, that is equal to the global memory transaction width. So, the L 1 which is also is configurable as L 1 or share memory, the width of the cache line is same as the global memory transactions, but in between I have the L 2 cache in unified L 2 cache across SMS which for which the lines are 32 bit width, 32 byte width right. So, essentially uh, when the L 1 has to read the number of reads is 4 for per unit and in that way whatever is the number of global loads since the number of global loads have to go through L 2 to L 1. L 1 is having a width which is matching the load width right the, uh, the, lo the load width which matches with the warps read width, but in between you have a L 2 cache which is 32 byte it is having cache lines which are 32 byte width. So, you have a factor of 4 increase in the number of L 1 reads required from the L 2 right. So, <coughs> Overall, the if you can look at here, since this is naive row, so the number of global loads is small, the stores are larger, and similar things we can also say for the L1 reads and writes. The number of reads is small, the number of writes are much more, which is completely coherent with the number of stores here. <coughs> but then, uh, if we go to the naive column implementation, we similarly see that this is the other way around the number of global loads is much more because they are not coalesced, they are loading from columns, the number of stores is much smaller. And uh, similarly, uh, so when the L 1 uh, is reading, they are same as the number of global loads, but when the L 2 writes, uh, when, the, when the L 1 writes to the L 2 cache, uh, I mean as of course, uh, it is much smaller uh, in number than the number of reads, but again we have this factor of 4 increase. When, with, when I look at the number of times L 1 writes to L 2 and the number of stores right. Because again uh, we have this uh, multiplication factor of 4 here because of the width issue that I just discussed. <coughs> so, this would be advisable at this point that you keep this, uh, these things in mind that whenever doing reads and write what is the width of the cache lines and uh, what is the width of the global memory transactions and uh, th these things may or may not change with architecture families. This is something we need to be aware of if you have to correctly interpret profiling data from any execution run. Now, this still does not really explain to us that uh, why uh, the, uh, the number of uh, 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 number of seconds or milliseconds the, the total amount of time taken by the naive row implementation was much smaller with respect to the knife column implementation, because in both case I have some penalty. In one case the penalty is with respect to the loads and in the other case the penalty is with respect to the stores. So, if you do a latency analysis in using the NVIDIA visual profiler, you see that uh, it provides the reasons why instructions stall and uh, it prevents the warps from executing. So, we always know that uh, the uh, we have lot of warps to execute but warps stall due to certain reasons right. And uh, the reasons can be uh, varying. For example, the pipeline may be busy. If the pipeline is busy, then the compute resources that are required by an instruction for the warp is not available right. So, the warp will stall. Then uh, the issue can be with constant, the some constant value is going to be required and that constant load is blocked due to a miss in the constants cache. So, as we know that constants can be stored in the separate constant cache rather than using the L 1 or shared value L 1 or shared memory. The other issue can be of memory throttling like there can be large number of pending pending memory operations which prevent further forward progress. Lot of pending memory operations are pending for a warp. So, it has to stall. Then the texture subsystem uh, if it is already fully utilized and uh, so, this is more for the graphics part if it is fully utilized and there are too many outstanding requests from the texture system, then also warps can get stalled. 
and of course the other thing is a warp can be blocked at a sync thread call because the other threads which are part of the block have not uh, are and part and hence part of the other warps have not progressed up to the synchronization barrier. So, uh, <coughs> the instruction if, they, if, if there is a stall in any uh, in any uh, any of the uh, any in any given cycle then it prevents the warp from executing uh, and uh, the different kind of instruction stalls that can happen can be classified into the following type like the instruction fetch uh, in this case if there is a stall then if the uh, then the next assembly instruction will not be fetched right. Now, of course, there can be execution dependency like an input is required by the instruction and that is not available. Of course, there can be memory dependency that I, I, I require the data points from the memory for I require to store data point into the memory. It cannot be done because the resources that the memory system is quite busy and then the warp is ready, but the warp scheduler uh, is not uh, ready to issue it. The warp scheduler may be busy with some other, other threads which it has already issued. So, there can be these several reasons right uh, due to which <coughs> warps may stall from execution. But if we do a analysis of these different types, so as we can see we have all these uh, listed types of different reasons for which the warp can stall from execution and if we do a latency analysis of both the kernels that we executed the knife row and knife call of kernels and see what was the primary reason for the warp stalling. Then we can see that the knife column kernel has significant amount of stall due to the warps not getting selected and the memory throttling issue. Whereas, in the knife row whenever there was some stall it was primarily to due to the pipeline being busy executing some operation right. Now, observe something that if the pipeline is busy in executing some operation it really is not a bad thing because still you have progress in terms of operation. But when you have the memory throttling issue uh, if you want you can just have a look into the memory throttling issue. So, essentially you have large number of memory operations that are pending right or uh, a memory dependency issue that is separate that load store cannot be made because the required resources are not available. For example, I am reading from multiple banks or two warps want to read from the same bank, but there is a but I cannot do that right. So, due to all these separate issues uh, I can have uh, stalls happening, but suppose uh, take this example in case of knife column memory throttling is a very big issue. That means, there are a lot of pending memory operations. and the warp not getting selected is also a significant big issue. Now, why would that happen? If you remember the knife row implementation you are able to load very fast since you are able to load very fast the warps would make progress, but they will get stalled in the right part. But here your warps cannot even make progress because you have got the issue that your loads are getting stalled because the loads are not coalesced in case of knife column right. So, since your loads are not coalesced the warps really cannot start executing or at least copying the data. So, that would actually create the more significant proportion of the scenario that memory throttling is happening and the warp is not selected. Now, of course, every kind of stall has a corresponding penalty, but things related to the memory will always have the larger penalty and since you are having lot of more load operations which are stalled that also contributes to the knife column implementation being faster slower uh, in this case. Now, of course, there can be further optimizations that can be made using the shared memory uh, or shared memory based uh, implementation of the code. Now, this is something which we will uh, like to take up in the next lecture. Uh, so, we will we'll like to see that how uh, the shared memory can actually help in uh, doing the transpose operations because till now all we have done is looked into the transpose operations from the point of view of the global memory loads and stores. So, with this we will end this lecture here. Thank you.